Welcome to BioCentury This Week, the podcast with BioCentury's editorial team. I'm Jeff Cranmer, executive editor here at BioCentury. And joining me today are my colleagues. I'm Stephen Hansen, director of Biopharma Intelligence. And Steve Austin, Washington editor. On today's podcast, our 2024 public markets preview, Janet Woodcock, an FDA icon, is stepping down after three decades at the agency. What does it mean for FDA? And the latest in the abortion drug case. All righty, let's get right to it. Stephen, the headline of your public markets preview is the year of biotech's recovery. When I read that, I thought, really? Yeah, it's, um, well, hopefully, maybe, <laughs> I think is the way to phrase it. Um, I spoke to 14 buy siders and bankers for the story. And um, I have to say, since sort of the end of 2020, this was probably the most positive sort of conversations that I've had with investors about the state of the public markets, the the prospect for positive performance on the public markets, but it did all come with sort of a huge caveat, and that was around interest rates. So you'll recall, I mean, obviously most people know now, you know, that biotech had a great sort of finish to the year last year. It was the first positive year for the XBI uh, since 2020, but the only reason that the XBI finished positively was because it had a 40% run-up since the start of November. And that was all driven by an anticipation in a uh, change in the Fed's stance on interest rates. And that sort of began to crystallize a bit more with the Fed meeting in December, in which they sort of signaled that there would be a coming falling interest rate environment. And so sort of the equities kind of took off from there. But the caveat to all of this is that that really kind of has to, to play out, kind of come to fruition or else, you know, this could be another another false start, which biotechs have seen plenty of uh over the past couple of years. So what's the financing environment like going into the into the new year? Yeah, so companies have been able to raise money, but it's largely been on catalyst driven financings for the past year. And, you know, we won't even really get into IPOs yet because I think it's still a little bit too early to be to be talking about IPOs. Um, but on the follow on side, you know, one of the positive things was to finish out the year, there was really good aftermarket performance. Again, it helped that that biotech was running up, but I think it was 84% of the follow-ons in the fourth quarter had positive aftermarket performance, you know, and that's compared to about half of the follow-ons in, in the third quarter. So that's a good sign. Another good sign was just in the week ahead of JP Morgan, there was about 1.7 billion raised in follow-ons. And that was more than the total amount of follow-ons that were raised in both January 2022 and January 2023. So, you know, that's a good sign. A couple of those were opportunistic. Yeah, no, it's trending in the right direction, I think, is a way to think about it. So is there is there concern about M&A? You know, I don't mean to be the skunk at the garden party, but looking at this from Washington, you know, there's the FTC's signal that it's going to take a much more aggressive stance toward transactions in the biopharma space. Did you detect anything from people that you spoke with relative to that? Yeah, so on the sort of on the political side, obviously, that was another part of the conversation that's, um, you know, obviously being an election year that sort of comes up and is on at sort of the front of people's mind. But kind of for the first time in a long time, right? I mean, drug pricing wasn't the biggest worry. The biggest worry, I think, is FTC. But I think it's more of a, at least at this point, right? It's still more of a theoretical worry than it is a, a true concern because other than the Sanofi Mays licensing deal, you know, the FTC hasn't really stepped in and actually quashed a big deal yet. So while that threat might be looming there, we saw nine deals get done in the fourth quarter. I think they were worth about $39 billion in total. Saw a couple more get done the first week of JP Morgan. And, you know, I mean, this is this is part of the lifeblood of the sector, right? I mean, this is how the sector operates. So um it's sort of seen as a necessary and and yeah, this is it's it's got to worry, but I don't think it's reached the point to where it's going to be putting sort of more of the generous population off. As long as deals keep getting done and they keep getting closed, I don't think it's a major worry yet. I think that I, would start that, to... You know, and I think that's a realistic way to look at it because the FTC is going to step up its scrutiny. It's probably going to try and maybe even manage to stop a few deals. 
but it doesn't have the bandwidth to go out there and um, scrutinize every single deal and take action against them. So I think that is probably a realistic way to look at it, that, you know, it's it's going to chill things a little bit. It's going to add some concerns, maybe some friction, but in itself, it's not likely to have a huge impact. Yeah. I mean, so if I compare it to the impact drug pricing had, right? I mean, if you look back, I mean, if we go back to 2015, right, and Hillary Clinton's, you know, infamous tweets that sort of sent the market down and sort of sent generalists sort of basically scared them off of biopharma for about a year and a half. I, I don't see that sort of reaction coming from, you know, concerns about the FTC. And I think you probably wouldn't have that kind of a reaction unless you actually had the FTC successfully stop a major m a you know transaction from happening so you know i think it's more just a wait and see you know see how aggressive they actually are and see what they actually try and follow through on but but for now i think it's more in the theoretical realm so nine billion dollar deals in the fourth quarter there were two i think in the third quarter and then at jp morgan i think we saw two you know that's in the first days of the month our investors and bankers expecting the pace to continue on the trajectory from the fourth quarter? I mean, obviously, the fourth quarter was very busy. Whether it's going to remain that busy, I think there's a little bit of skepticism, but I think it will still be a driving, you know, it'll still be one of the drivers for for the sector. Just if you look at some of the valuations on these deals, I, I think there's some expectation that 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 won't go unnoticed by some of the sort of the broader investor population, you know, the, the the generalists. I mean, if you look at just for instance, Harpoon Therapeutics, Merck announced that they were going to acquire Harpoon at the beginning of the JP Morgan conference for $23 a share. Harpoon was trading at just above $3 a share in October. And so I think that just is a good example or an illustration of some of the potential disconnect there is between and, you know, what, how the market is valuing, you know, some of these small cap biotech companies and, you know, what pharmacies as the value for these companies. And um, I think that's only a positive thing in terms of sort of highlighting, you know, potential uh, arbitrage opportunity for for investors that want to, uh, you know, want to get more exposure to the sector. Yeah. And that that trading at three dollars a share, that was after a 10 to one reverse stock split as well. So that's right. Um, but still good to see that take out. You mentioned that uh, follow-ons largely are catalyst-driven. Is this a bit of a case of have and have-nots? What What about the companies that don't have catalysts? How are companies' cash positions looking right now? Yeah, no, and so that's where I think having this sort of more positive and more sort of open to getting deals done sort of environment hopefully will be very helpful because, you know, we estimated that at the end of the fourth quarter, at the end of the year, like 46% of companies across all exchanges were at one year or less of cash. So sector is still quite desperate for raising capital. A lot of them have been holding off, you know, at these low valuations have been holding off and waiting and waiting to do financing. So I think there is some expectation that if this market sentiment can hold for the first say quarter or, or even for the first half of the year, that there's going to be a flood of, of financings that are going to come whether they need to be catalyst driven or whether they need to be opportunistic. I mean, the opportunistic ones that we got that we saw get done uh, in the early part of the month were for larger sort of higher quality companies. And I think that's always going to be the case, right? I mean, the better companies are going to have a better opportunity to raise money. It may just be that if a company is really that desperate, it may be a situation where we see, you know, differences in terms of the discount that they have to take. Mm -hmm. And and a continuation of some of the more creative, uh, financings that we've seen. I, I know you said it's a little too early to talk IPOs, but we, we should note that we've seen a handful of companies file to go public in NASDAQ. You know, in my conversations around the JP Morgan conference, um, a lot of investors are saying it's sort of all eyes on those companies. They, they want to see them get out before they go stale in mid-February or so. And if those... Um, Price nicely, Stephen. Might might we see um, kind of this this backlog that the shadow backlog of IPOs that's probably out there? Will we start to see kind of a rush to file? Um, we could. So the expectation that I got from most folks was so we had I think there were eleven Nasdaq biotech IPOs last year. Sort of the the very the very rough 
tally that you know when I was asking folks about their expectations was we definitely expect to see that maybe you might see 20 this year if you start looking at if we're going to get to 30 that might be more of a push so the key will be to see how those IPOs trade in the aftermarket I think if they trade well and if they stay up in the first 30 60 days after they price yeah then you could start to see maybe more deals get done and start to see a little bit of momentum but you know we really need to see the follow-on market start to be very, very active. I think you need to start to see follow-ons, you know, being oversubscribed, meaning you've got more investors wanting to buy than, you know, there is stock available. Because it's really when you start getting that excitement and getting into new companies and investing in new companies, that's when the IPOs can really start to work. And I just don't know if we're there yet. All righty. Thanks for that, Stephen. Stephen's story is up on biocentury.com. Let's take a quick break now, and then we'll come back and we'll head to Washington. For more than 20 years, BioEquity Europe has been where CEOs and investors gather to network, partner, and debate critical issues facing the biotech industry. In 2024, BioEquity heads to San Sebastian, Spain, in Basque Country, May 12th to 14th. Join BioCentury, EBD Group, and Regional Host Committee Chair, ECOS Capital, and one of the world's culinary capitals, don't wait. Last year's BioEquity conference sold out. Visit BioEquityEurope.com for more information. All right, we are back. Longtime FDA leader Janet Woodcock will be retiring at the end of the month. Let's turn to Steve now. Steve, what is Janet's legacy at the agency? Well, I think for the biopharm industry, for patients who rely on the biopharm industry, Janet Woodcock was the FDA for decades. She led the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research twice for a total of 19 years. She held senior positions in the Office of the Commissioner, and of course, she served as Acting Commissioner for a year. You know, as I wrote in the story, Janet Woodcock really redefined drug regulation. She took it from a passive activity. FDA just sitting back and waiting for applications to come in and then giving a thumbs up or down to an active collaboration with product developers. She made drug regulation far more efficient. When I spoke with her a few days ago, she recalled that when she became CEDAR director, the center had a backlog of 25,000 unprocessed adverse event reports, and it had some kind of Rube Goldberg system where it shuffled them from state to state where they were microfiched and indexed and so on. It couldn't track its own correspondence. Reviewers plowed through reams of paper and dictated reports into dictaphones that secretaries typed up. And, and this was 1994. You know, this sounds like 1964. So she really brought Cedar kind of kicking and screaming into the modern era. It certainly isn't uh, the most efficient, well-oiled machine in the world right now, but it's a lot better than when she, that it would have been if she hadn't done that. Um, a lot of what she did was controversial. And her management style was controversial. You know, some of her colleagues believe that she was autocratic. And I think she would say that um, she was tough and that that's what she needed to do to get things done. Steve, one of the more controversial aspects of her tenure was her tendency, I, I don't know if that's the right word, to overrule consensus decisions made by agency review staff. And you wrote that this has been emulated by some of the other leaders at FDA. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's a little bit too strong to say it was a tendency. There was, there's one clear example. It was the approval of Sarepta's Exondus 51 treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Just about everyone who was involved in, that, in reviewing that product believed that it shouldn't be approved, that the company hadn't demonstrated that it was effective, and Janet Woodcock looked at it and she overruled all of them and said, no, it should go on the market. It was interesting when I, when I asked her about that specifically, and she said, basically, look, these patients had nothing. They had no um, other possibility. The disease is terrible. It's terrible for the boys, mostly boys who get the disease. It's terrible for their families. And she believed that they should have access to this drug, even if there was just a hope that it could provide some small increment of benefit. I think that that's really the key thing that's controversial. Not so much that she overruled all of the review staff, but this idea that FDA should lower the bar. And she said specifically, she said she believes in a low bar for products to treat serious diseases 
when there are no other options. That's a very controversial idea. There are people in industry, there are patient groups who believe that doesn't do a service to patients, basically that you're um, letting placebos out on the market and that it makes it more difficult than to develop products that are really effective. And there are others who uh, believe, yes, that patients should have that right to decide and they should know when there's uncertainty, what that level of uncertainty is, and then make their own decisions. What Dr. Woodcock said is that Patricia Cavazzoni, who she recruited to come to FDA and who now is the head of CEDAR and Peter Marks, the director of the Center for Biologics, share her views on that topic. I've spoken with both of them and interviewed them in the last few months. And yeah, they've said similar things. They do share that view. The interesting thing is that she said that many people on the FDA staff don't share that view. They have a more traditional view about what the threshold should be for approval for products. Um, and I think that that's one of the pieces of unfinished business that she left behind was developing a consensus at the agency on this topic. And in the absence of a consensus, there's going to be continued controversy and there's going to be inconsistency because Patricia Cavazzoni and Peter Marks can't get involved in every single drug approval decision. They can't get involved in every decision where there's a, a controversy over the need to have more rigor in the evidence for um, efficacy. So, Steve, what uh, what's next for Janet Wicca? Uh, that's really interesting. So I asked her that, uh, and she said, look, she said she's uh, 75 years old. She was at FDA. I don't know if we said this for, for 37 years. So she has personal things that she wants to do, and she mentioned some of those. But she said that the, she does have some plans for some other things. But uh, she said that the um, ethics police at, at FDA told her that she shouldn't talk about those before she leaves. And I said, well, what are they going to do, fire you? Um, but, but she didn't bite. and She didn't tell me what she's going to do. So I don't know what it is, but my impression was that she does have some things that she's planning to do in addition to the things that she wants to do personally. And what's next for FDA? You know, I think, as I said, I think there's going to be there's going to continue to be controversy and inconsistency over approval decisions because there is this gap between the mindset of the leaders of the Centers for Drugs and Biologics and the review staff. On the other hand, Dr. Woodcock recruited people who, for senior positions, who share her um, views and her mindset. In addition to Patricia Cavazzoni, who's the director of the Center for Drugs. There's Peter Stein, who's the um, director of the Office of New Drugs at CEDAR. And there, there's some other officials there who kind of were recruited by and have and share the views that, that Dr. Woodcock had. So I think, you know, there's going to be a new generation, the generational change. There's going to be a wider generational change. There are some other senior FDA officials who are senior both because they've got high positions and also because they've been there for many decades. And you know, before long, we're going to see, I think, a turnover at the top of the agency and throughout it. All right. Thanks for that. Steve Story up on biocentury.com. Well worth reading to get to know your FDA history and really what Janet Woodcock has uh, done for drug regulation in the U.S. and really that read through um, to drug regulation around the world. Okay, Steve, there was a, uh, a ruling out of Texas in the abortion drug case. It seems like it could be an important one. Can you unpack this for us? Okay, so uh, just a little recap on what this case is about. Uh, the abortion drug Mifepristone, there's a Texas judge who ruled uh, last year that um, FDA's approval of the drug was in violation of the law and also that its decisions to relax some of the restrictions that had been imposed on the drug also violated the law. That went up to an appeals court, which partially affirmed and partially denied his ruling, and it's been appealed to the Supreme Court. The biopharma industry believes that there's a lot at stake here because they believe that if, if the rulings against FDA are allowed to stand, then it will subject any FDA approval to second guessing by judges. That's something that hasn't happened in the past. And also, critically, that almost anybody would have standing to bring such cases. 
a lot of people who looked at the case thought, well, the Supreme Court is going to throw it out based on the standing because the case was brought by physicians, emergency room physicians who don't prescribe the drug and who haven't even had patients who have experienced problems with it, but they brought up the hypothetical issue that they may someday have to treat a woman who has had an adverse event associated with mifepristone and that gives them standing. A lot of people think, a lot of lawyers told me that the Supreme Court is likely to throw the suit out based on this uh, very broad idea of standing and it wouldn't even necessarily have to touch the other issues. What happened last week is that the Texas judge allowed three states, Missouri, Kansas, and Idaho, to intervene in the case and said these states have standing. What that means is that if the Supreme Court throws the case out because it decides that the physicians who brought the case don't have standing, the case will go forward based on these three states having standing. The interesting thing is, is that mifepristone is banned in all of these states. And what the attorneys general of those states argued to the Texas judge is that the fact that their citizens go to other states and get access to mifepristone gives them standing in this case. What it means is that this isn't going away anytime soon. Steve, when do you expect the Supreme Court to rule in the case? Probably in the spring, but definitely before July. And there's a range of things they could do. As I said, they could throw it out for standing. If that happens, it's going to kick it back down to the Texas court to look at um, the case from the standpoint of the states. They could also make a ruling on some of the substantive issues, and then that would that might potentially have a different outcome. Okay, thanks for that. Obviously, we'll keep watching this one. And Steve, Stephen, thanks very much. Thanks out there for tuning in to BioCentury this week. We'll catch you next week. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.